We turn in the word of God to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 10 to verse 12. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 10 to verse 12. Isaiah 60 verse 10. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favour have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be opened continually, they shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Amen. Thus far we read the word of God. Our theme is Zion's king is the king of kings and the king of nations. Zion's king is the king of kings and the king of nations. As a church we proclaim the kingship of Christ but behind that slogan there must be doctrinal content otherwise it becomes an empty slogan with no real meaning and the slogan continues but the substance and meaning uh, has evaporated. What do we mean? by Christ as King. We mean, first of all, that Christ is King over his church, and he is King and Head of the church in two senses. Firstly, he has authority to command the church what it should do, how it should be governed, by whom it should be governed, what doctrine should be taught, and by whom it should be taught how God should be worshipped and how discipline should be upheld. But as well as being the authoritative ruling king and head of the church, he is also the life-giving head. He is the source of the life and power in the church. It is by his spirit that the church is built up and it is by his spirit that uh, the people of God are enabled to submit to him and so he is the authoritative head and he is the organic head of the church he tells the church what to do and he alone can enable its performance but he is not only head of the church in its organized uh, sense and as it acts as an organized body but he is the king of the individual members and families in the church their lives individually their lives in their families in their homes is subject to the authority of Christ and dependent upon the power of Christ to enable that submission which is his due but he is also king over all things in providence. Our Lord Jesus governs all things. He fulfills the Father's good pleasure from his right hand, bringing about the outworking of the eternal decree of God, whereby he has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. And he is the rightful authoritative king over all. He has the right to tell everyone, everywhere, how to live individually, as families, and as nations. Every individual, every family, every nation, as the gospel comes to them, is duty bound to submit to Christ personally and to bring forth the fruits of repentance 
individually and in their family life and in their national life. And any individual, family or nation that ignores King Jesus is in rebellion against him. These things are to be kept in mind. Now in this passage, the Lord continues to speak of the future blessing of the church. Some refer this simply to the return from the captivity in Babylon, but it is self-evident that it describes uh, a blessing far beyond what was entailed in the return of the Jews from Babylonish captivity. And though that may have been a preliminary fulfillment, it looks far beyond that and uh, takes us, as we've said previously, to see the high tide of gospel blessing promised in the New Testament age when Christ has been manifest and exalted and is reigning at God's right hand until he makes all his enemies his footstool. And in other words, it describes the advance of the gospel among the Gentiles, but it describes that advance at its highest pitch, uh, a highest pitch not yet attained. Firstly then, the revival and enlargement of the church is ascribed to the Lord's mercy. The revival and enlargement of the church is ascribed to the Lord's mercy. Verse 10, And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favour have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be opened continually, they shall not be shut day nor night, that men may no bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. You see the connection word therefore in verse 11. Because of verse 10, verse 11 will be fulfilled. Zion here is the church, or the city of Jerusalem is the church of God with the faithful Israelites as the natural branches to, into which will be joined in the wild olive branches of the Gentiles. So it is the church, but the church considered as, first of all, the continuation of the Old Testament church, that is Israel, and the believing Israelites, them, as it were, carrying on into the New Testament and that, uh, that Israelite core having added to it the forces of the Gentiles. And verse 11 speaks of a time using the Old Testament language of the literal city of Jerusalem to describe it symbolically. It describes the city as having its gates open continually. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles. Now verse 10 speaks of the sons of strangers building up thy walls. It is true that uh, in the Old Testament the literal walls that Cyrus uh, unwittingly as it were uh, was the providential instrument of the building of those literal walls. But this isn't talking about uh, simply a providential but unwitting assistance uh, of the church. It's talking about the forces of the Gentiles coming willingly into the church, into the city, into the kingdom of God and of grace. And the gates being opened continually, not being shut day nor night. This has been taken by some as referring to the church's safety, as when uh, 
The church is likened to a city without walls, not needing walls because the Lord is looking after his church. But this is a mistake. Here, it is not the safety that is in view, so that the walls, don't, the gates don't need to be closed day and all night. That's not the idea. They need to be open day and night because of the constant flow of the Gentiles coming in and bringing their strength and their wealth to the uh, city of God. And so what we have here then is a picture of great and sustained advance as the gospel is preached and sinners are brought into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is setting before us the high tide of gospel blessing among the Gentiles as they come into the church of God. And in verse 10 it is traced to the Lord's mercy and favour. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favour have I had mercy on thee. It is the mercy of God. It is the day of the Lord's favour to his church that explains this gospel advance. We saw last time how the conversion of, the, uh, of multitudes is described as doves flying to their windows. That's true even on a, a, a sparse level, that every true conversion to Christ is the life-giving power of God working in the soul of one of God's elect so that they who were dead in sins before fly to Christ with life given from above. But it's also true when multitudes flock to Christ, when a little one becomes a thousand and a small one a mighty nation in a day as it were, if we then long for days of gospel advance, and surely we do, we must be faithful certainly in our responsibilities, but we must seek above all the mercy and favour of God. We cannot produce reviving. We cannot produce spiritual life. It belongs to the Lord. And if our beloved has withdrawn himself and hides his face from his church, let us seek after him that he would return in mercy and give us a day of his power to make the church fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. But perhaps you object here. Isn't this passage referred to in Revelation 21, which we read earlier? And is not that passage speaking of the glorified church? So Revelation 21, verse 24 well, reading from verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honour into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. And they shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You may say, is not this passage about the glorified church? Yes, it is. But then, surely... There shall be no gathering in 
of the nations in the glorified church. That's the eternal, the final state of the church. What then is the answer? Well, the answer is that sometimes the picture of the glorified church involves a flashback to its history to explain how it came to be so glorious. How did it come about that this church is so glorious, this heavenly city in its splendor? How did it happen? It happened through the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ, shedding his blood to redeem a people from all iniquity and applied by the Spirit. But how did it become so populous, this city of blessedness, that uh, it is a city of perfected fellowship. But how, how did the, so many end up in this city? And the answer is because the Lord by his power caused the nations to flow into the kingdom of grace and multitudes to come into the kingdom of God on earth. And that great multitude are now glorified in the church uh, in its final and eternal state. In other words, there is a continuity between the church on earth and the church in its glorified and eternal state. There is continuity. There is continuity from the church in the Old Testament into the New and into the eternal state. And so many of the parables speak of the final sifting and purging and purifying of the church, of its false members and its perfection and glory in the eternal world. And so the vast population of this heavenly Jerusalem, the means by which that came about is the gospel being preached among all nations so that ultimately the forces, the strength of the Gentiles comes into the church of God until the full vast tally of the elect of God are gathered in and then the church is glorified. But then secondly, when kings do what they ought, when kings do what they ought, verse 10, And I, the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. The kings shall minister unto thee. Is that just referring to to them doing so in the providence of God. Like Cyrus. No. Look at the next verse. Verse 11. That men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles and that their kings may be brought. The kings are brought, led into the city of God. They are not merely inadvertently supportive. They actually flock in to the kingdom of of God. And so they do what they ought to do. They come into the kingdom and they build the church of God. They are instrumental in strengthening the church as those who themselves are part of the church. But what should kings and rulers do? What ought kings and rulers to do? What is the duty of those who rule over nations? What is the duty of our Prime Minister? What is his obligation, his standing obligation? Now, what is he to do? If he came among us tonight, could we tell Gordon Brown what he should be doing? Well, the first thing is that he should repent and believe the gospel. He should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him for acceptance with God and bow the knee to him 
as an individual and acknowledge him as rightful king over him. But not all, that's not all. It is the duty of rulers, as we saw just a few weeks ago, to acknowledge Christ not only as king over them personally, but in their public office. He is king of kings and lord of lords. That means kings and lords must acknowledge and should acknowledge that he is their king. We mentioned a few weeks back that Psalm 2, the earlier verses, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine of vain things? Kings of the earth stood up and the rulers took counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us cast away their cause from us. And that, that those verses in Psalm 2, in Acts chapter 4, are applied to Pilate and to Herod, not in their purely personal antagonism to our Lord Jesus Christ, but in their public use of their authority against the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't simply that Herod and Pilate as individuals opposed Christ. They used their civil power against Christ. That being the case then, that tells us that it is wrong for rulers to use their civil power against Christ and against his truth and against his cause. It must therefore be their duty to use their power, uh, their authority as rulers in the interests of the honour of Christ and the good of his cause and church. And so when Psalm 2 goes on to say, you tell kings, kiss the sun, be wise, ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with trembling. It's telling them not only that individually should they bow the knee to him in their personal life, but as rulers they must acknowledge Christ's kingship over them. Well, we've seen that before. But let's mention a little more. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, or verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So we are to pray for kings and for all in authority, not simply out of regard to their individual welfare and pray for their conversion for that reason, valid though it no doubt is, but also we are to pray for them that they will so act that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And if that is what we are to pray for, then it must be right for kings and for all in authority to act in the interests of godliness and honesty. And that is the obligation of rulers to acknowledge Christ as their king and to use their authority under Christ in the interests of truth and godliness. So when we ask the question, should the Pope be allowed to visit this country? The answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is because Christ should be acknowledged as king of the nation. He is not a citizen of the nation, 
and there is no obligation whatsoever for the exact opposite upon a government to admit to a country someone who will promote false religion and damage the true interests of that country. <coughs> so that just as we are not obliged to allow Islamists into this country, so we are not obliged to allow a pseudo-Christian uh, papal uh, man of sin into this country. Because the duty of rulers is to acknowledge the authority of Christ and to use their position for the honour of Christ, not in the interests of the Antichrist. Then again, in Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, we are told in verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. And uh, verse 4, uh, For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, this tells us what rulers ought to do. In God's providence, to a degree, and for their own wrong reasons, ungodly rulers may sometimes actually do it in the sense of punishing some things that are evil. But it is their duty to actually begin by acknowledging the authority of Christ and that God defines what is evil. How can a ruler punish evil as he ought if he doesn't acknowledge God as the definer of what is evil. So that civil government is not neutral. It is not religiously neutral. Even on the most fundamental level of who defines right and wrong, Every civil ruler either gets his definition from God in the scriptures or he gets it from man. Sadly, too often the church laments without knowing what we actually want. Yes, we know that we do not want the wholesale slaughter of infants in the womb in the form of abortion. We know we don't want that. We know we don't want assisted suicide. But we've got to go back further than these ghastly symptoms where does authority begin? It begins with God and with his Christ. Who tells rulers what to do? God does. Civil government is not neutral. It isn't a sphere where we close our Bibles and say, well, we just settle for some common decency denominator. Christ is to be acknowledged as King. Our covenanting forefathers stood for that principle. No King but Christ. We know of no politician in living memory 
who has come within a thousand miles of this. In the United States, you get politicians claiming to be born again. But if any of them are, that's good. But it still doesn't mean that they know how to run a country. They need to be taught what the Bible says. What the Bible teaches about the duty of rulers. If they hold to it, in the present climate, they'll not get elected. Of course they won't. But they should hold to it because it's true. Our Lord Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How does Christ use his kingly authority, which is absolute? He uses it in the interests of his church. In Matthew chapter 5, the individual believer is told to be like his Father in heaven and so to love his enemies and bless them that persecute him. He is to be patterned after his Father in heaven. If that's true for individuals, it's true for rulers. Kings are to be patterned after the King of Kings. He uses his absolute authority for the good of his church. So what is a subordinate king to do? He is to be patterned after the king of kings and use his limited authority in the interests of the church. You see, we don't believe that civil government in itself is too dirty for Christians to be bothered about. But neither do we believe that Christians should treat it as neutral. We believe there is a Christian view of civil government. And that we should hold to it. Come with me. We've mentioned before the need for a right view of history, a right view of history within, within these islands. In 1643, the Solemn League and Covenant was signed, committing England, Scotland and Ireland to acknowledging Christ as king over the three kingdoms. Perhaps we don't realize that the, ex the extent of the effect of the gospel at that time. In the years around the Westminster Assembly, Puritan ministers, members of the Westminster Assembly who drew up our confession of faith and catechism, used to regularly preach to the House of Commons and to the House of Lords. Can you just imagine that? The members of Parliament filing into one of the church buildings in London to listen to a Puritan sermon. But it happened many times. And we're not just talking about a five-minute little talk. We're talking about full-length sermons. The Scottish commissioners who came down from the Church of Scotland to help at the Westminster Assembly, they preached to the House of Commons and to the House of Lords. Samuel Rutherford, George Gillespie, Alexander Henderson, Robert Bailey. Their sermons are in print. We mentioned a while back 
that sometimes people say, well, was the Puritan age a time of revival? If that isn't a time of revival, I don't know what is. When the gospel had such influence that the very governing bodies would listen to the preaching of the word. What would it take? What would it take to see our houses of parliament going into one of the church buildings in London to listen to an hour or more preaching from a faithful minister of Christ, it would take a revival. The highest point of the church within these islands was when the National Covenant was signed in Scotland and the Solemn League and Covenant was signed in England, Scotland and Ireland. The Reformation was a high point. What is known as the Second Reformation was a higher point still. And as we said another time, it's been up and down, downwards ever since. That was the high point. And we long to see reviving that will bring us back and beyond such a day of the Lord's power. You see, there are a few, four views, basically, of the relationship between church and state. There's the Roman Catholic view, where the church, by which they mean the papacy, governs the state. Because they believe that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, he represents not only Christ's headship over the church, but Christ as king of nations. And therefore, the nations are to be subject to the papacy. That's why the, uh, Pope, uh, the, that's why the Vatican is a, is a, is a, sees itself as a state and has a foreign office, a huge, vast machinery, because he claims political power as well as church power. The church governs the state, or at least the so-called vicar of Christ, the head of the church, governs the state. We reject that. We reject all the spurious claims of the Pope of Rome. Then there's the Erastian view, named after a man called Erastus. On this view, if as a nation, if a government professes the Christian religion, then the civil ruler governs the church. That's what lies behind the arrangement of the Church of England and the idea that the monarch is the head of the church. On that view, the ruler, the civil ruler, governs the church. The third view is what is called the voluntary view, where church and state have no real connection at all. And then there's the reform view. And the reform view, which we believe to be the scriptural one, is that church and state are to be both subject to Christ with mutual obligations to each other. The church is to bear witness to the duty of the state to teach the state. That's why men like Rutherford preach to the houses of Parliament to teach the state its duty as well as the edification of the members individually. And it is the duty of the state to uphold the law of God in the public domain so as to facilitate the church in its distinctive role. That's the biblical and reformed view, both subject to Christ. Not one governing the other, but one, uh, but both having obligations to each other. And because the state is to uphold the law of the Lord in its proper public domain, then in that sense it serves the church. And that's why we have in our passage references to kings serving the interests of Zion. And we should pray for this. We should pray for the conversion of multitudes of individuals. We should pray for the conversion of families and of households. We should pray that 
Christ's kingship will be acknowledged by heads of families nurturing their children in the truth. And we should pray that the tide of gospel blessing will reach such a height that kings and princes and rulers will bow the knee to our Lord Jesus Christ. It is for these things that the covenant uh, church, however poorly in recent uh, generations, nevertheless, it is for these things that the covenant uh, church has stood and should still stand. And our text encourages us that these things will come to pass even beyond what we have yet seen. But then thirdly and finally, what does God do with those who don't do what they should? What does God do with those who don't do what they should? Verse 12, For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. God judges nations in this world. There are no nations in the world to come. There are individuals. And God judges individuals finally and eternally in the world to come. But in this world, he judges nations as well as individuals. He judges Nations as such, and nations, and the government of nations. And this verse tells us that this is the word of the Lord. The nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, they shall be utterly wasted. The kingdom, the nation that will not serve the interests of Christ and of Israel and of his church will perish. Where does that leave our nation? A nation that once did own Christ as king. A nation that once had gospel ministers preach to its houses of parliament and now is bent, determined to obliterate everything distinctively Christian from the face of, the, of society. And that is the situation. There is an antagonism. Oh yes, the natural man is always antagonistic to the gospel, but there is an expression of antagonism to the gospel that is tangible. Anything is better than Christianity. doesn't matter how bad or how destructive or how declared in its enmity against the nation. It's still better in the eyes certainly of our rulers and presumably many of the people to biblical Christianity. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Our nation is surely heading either for a turning or for judgment. If there is no outpouring of the Spirit and repentance, if God does not visit us in mercy, surely he will visit us in judgment.
God is not mocked. Not by individuals, and not by nations, and not by governments. As a man soweth, so shall he reap, and so will a nation, and so will a government. We should pray for this wretched nation in all our wickedness that the Lord will yet have mercy. And if God judges nations of men in this world, he judges individuals, every one in the world to come. If he ruins nations for contempt of Christ and of his gospel, in this world, he will ruin forever those every individual who despises the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a gospel despiser, you must wake up. There is an end to these things. And the living and true God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And the exalted Lord Jesus will call us all to account for all our sins, and above all for our use or abuse of the gospel made known to us. The man with the, who was given the pound and did nothing with it was cast into outer darkness. You've had the gospel preached to you. You know or have heard that there is salvation in Jesus Christ alone. Seek him in a day of mercy. For the day will come when there will be no more gospel made known to sinners. When the Lord Jesus, who by his ministers says, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, he will say it no more. And he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. That day is not yet. You are still in this world. And you must seek mercy from the God of heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord is gracious and ready to forgive and rich in mercy to all that call upon him in truth. Amen.